Welcome to a new lesson. This lesson is going to be on the treatment of opioid overdose. And this is actually going to be a two-part lesson. Um, it just a lot of material to cover and uh, when I was trying to put it all together it came out to be 30 minutes and I just don't like long videos like that. So this is going to be, like I said, a two-part video. Part one is going to be kind of some background and we're going to talk about diagnosing opioid overdose and a few other things, but those are kind of the key points. Part two, which is going to be a separate video, is going to talk about treatment. Uh, recommended treatment, kind of the standard of care for treat treating an opioid overdose. So that's kind of our plan for this lesson. And uh, I wanted to talk about this because I think that opioid overdose is one of those things that an EMS we kind of we we say that it's easy and that it's obvious and it shouldn't require that much critical thinking, but in reality it does. And I found a lot of people have a lot of confusion about opioid overdoses. But unlike maybe some other conditions, this is something that we're afraid to ask about because there's this culture that oh it's easy, you just give them some Narcan and it's done. Give them some Naloxone. What's the question? Why do you have any issues? And so people don't ask the questions, and they need to because this is actually a, a fairly complex topic. So that's why I wanted to make this video. And as I was researching, I came across kind of three myths that involve uh, opioid overdose. So these three myths, and I'll just kind of briefly summarize them here. I'll put them in a red color since they're myths. They're bad. They're not true. The first one is that you can't give too much naloxone or Narcan. And that's the drug we're going to be talking about really today is naloxone. You can't give too much naloxone, which is the same as Narcan, just a brand name. That's absolutely untrue, and we'll talk about in this video what can happen in a Narcan or a naloxone overdose. You can absolutely give too much, and you can cause some very serious and potentially life-threatening side effects by giving too much naloxone. The second myth is kind of similar to the first one, but it says, oh, it well, it can't hurt, or it won't hurt to give naloxone. It won't hurt. And usually where I hear this myth is when people are talking about trying to diagnose an opioid overdose. They're not sure if the patient has an opioid overdose, but they think, well, maybe. And there's this myth that, well, if you have the slightest suspicion that a patient just might even have an opioid overdose, you should just go ahead and give them naloxone just to be safe because it won't hurt. Again, tying in with the first myth, that's absolutely untrue. You can hurt a patient by giving them naloxone, especially if they don't need it in the first place. And finally, the third one is that it works on narcotic overdoses. It works on narcotic, and I'll just put OD, overdose. It works on narcotic overdoses. We're going to talk a little bit about the word narcotic because the word narcotic doesn't really have a good defined meaning. So naloxone or Narcan works on opioid overdoses, but not necessarily narcotic overdoses. It really depends on what narcotic we're talking about. So those are our three myths, and our goal is going to be to dispel all three of those throughout this lesson while also learning some good stuff about naloxone or about Narcan. So the first question here, the first sort of obvious question is, what are opioids? What are they? Well, simply, they're, they're derivatives of the opium plant. There's just plant opium, and you can process it in certain ways and get certain things. And there are several classes. We're going to talk about four classes of opioids today. The first one, the class is called the opiates. These are the naturally derived, and I'll put up here natural in parentheses. These are the naturally derived uh, opioids, so they come from the opium plant. There's morphine, that's one that certainly most people have at least heard of, even if you don't know much about it, and there's codeine. Those are the two big ones that we're going to talk about in this lesson, morphine and codeine. And then it makes sense that if you have the naturally derived opiates, uh, then you have the not so naturally derived, you have the synthetics. And technically there's two different classes here, there's synthetics and then there's semi-synthetics. For our purposes, for pre-hospital medicine, there's really no important difference between synthetic and semi-synthetic opioids, so we're going to lump them together just to make our lives a little bit easier in this lesson. But realize that they're technically two different classes. So these are drugs like heroin, 
hydrocodone, and hydrocodone is the same as Vicodin, hydrocodone or Vicodin, hydromorphone, and this is the same as Dilaudid, oxycodone, which is the same as oxycontin, fentanyl, and this is a drug that, at least in pre-hospital medicine, has been gaining a lot of popularity lately. It's got a lot of the positive effects of morphine, but not as many of the negative side effects. So fentanyl is becoming more and more popular in pre-hospital medicine. There's methadone. And then we've got this one. I'm going to put it um, down here anyway because it is technically an opioid. It's loperamide. And if that sounds familiar, it's also called emodium. It's the anti-diarrheal drug. The next class are the or is the antagonists. And this first one is the one that should be most familiar, and this is what this lesson is really all about, is naloxone. That's the same as Narcan. And that's what we're going to talk about later. But just for your reference, there's a couple of other ones. One is naltrexone. And there's a third one called nalmaphene. And I'm kind of running out of room here, but let's see if I can squeeze it in. Nalmaphene. So those are three of the common antagonists, but like I said, by and large, naloxone is the most popular, and this is what we're going to talk about today. And finally, the fourth class, we have the endogenous peptides. Now, endogenous, in case you're not familiar, just means that it's, it comes from the body. It was generated by the body, and peptide is just a type of chemical. It's a chain of amino acids, so it's almost a protein, but not quite. Basically, it's just a chemical that your body makes on its own. And the only one I'm going to talk about here is endorphin. And I'm mentioning it because I think it's interesting that endorphin, many of you have heard of endorphin. This is that hormone that gets released when you have, uh, oftentimes when you're exercising and after a while you start to feel kind of good about exercising. Or maybe if you're running, you get that runner's high people talk about. Well, that's because endorphin is actually an opioid. And the name endorphin itself comes from endogenous morphine. So you can kind of see here, I'll try and highlight to make it easier to notice. You've got the endo from endogenous and the orphan from morphine. Endorphin, endogenous morphine. So endorphin is actually an opioid that your body itself creates and releases. I've never heard of someone having an endogenous uh, endorphin overdose. I don't know if it is possible. It might be. You'd have to look through some medical literature, see if there's a case study. Uh, I've never heard of it, but just merely interesting to note that endorphin is also an opioid. So I'm going to put up here that word we talked about earlier, narcotic. What is a narcotic? Well, it's a good question, and lots of people have lots of different answers. So the word narcotic doesn't have any one accepted legal or medical definition, especially not in the United States. There is, it varies depending on who you talk to and what jurisdiction you're in. Generally speaking, in the U.S., narcotic, generally speaking, refers to the opioids plus cocaine. And not necessarily mixed together, but any opioid or cocaine can be referred to as narcotics. There are some places where they use the word narcotic to refer to any illegal drug, whether that's illegal because it's a, a recreational street drug or because it's a prescription drug that's being used uh, not under the physician's orders. So this word narcotic should really be avoided in pre-hospital medicine because it just it doesn't have any good definition, like I said. And as, as far as medically speaking go, it doesn't really have a good basis. So I would strongly advise that you avoid using this word narcotic in EMS. Call it an opioid, or call it cocaine, or call it whatever it is, but I don't like the word narcotic in medicine. So what happens during an opioid overdose? Opioid overdose. What happens? So as you know, there are cells all throughout the body, and I'm going to draw a little imaginary cell here, and I'm going to draw this sort of textbook round cell, even though the Cells that react with opioids are primarily in the brain, so they're actually not going to be round. They're going to be those 
longer synapse neuron cells. But just to make things easy, I'm drawing a classic textbook round cell. I'll even draw a little nucleus in there with some DNA, and I'll draw some organelles throughout here. So this is our cell. And on the surface of the cell, we have these uh, cell surface receptors. As the name implies, these are just things on the surface of the cell, and they can receive other things, usually chemicals. So chemicals can come bind to these cell surface receptors, and that triggers some sort of response within the cell. They're much smaller than I drew them here. They're, the cell itself is microscopic, and the receptors are tiny on top of that. But just to make it easy, I kind of drew them here, and I'm going to blow it up even more. I'm going to make this huge, cartoonishly large receptor, just so that we can kind of see it and understand it a little better. But just know that this is disproportionate. Really, it would be much smaller. So here's this receptor. I'm going to draw kind of a diamond-shaped notch on the surface of it. And basically what happens is that floating all throughout your bloodstream and um, among all your cells are all sorts of things, chemicals and hormones and all sorts of things. And I'm just going to give them different shapes to keep it easy. Here's a circle. Here's a triangle. I'll draw... Um, I don't know, a semicircle, and they're all just floating around all the time. And there are all these different cell surface receptors on, on most of your cells in the body which can bind with certain things. So as you can see here, the circle would not be able to bind into this diamond-shaped receptor. The semicircle would not be able to bind into the diamond-shaped receptor, but the triangle could come in here and bind. And when that happens, like I said, it triggers some sort of response. So that cell surface receptor can trigger the release of some other chemical within the cell and that other chemical can have a response. So that's just a very basic uh, cellular biology explanation of cell surface receptors. So in your synapse cells primarily, also in, in your intestine and in some other areas, but primarily in your uh, synapse cells in your brain, in your brain cells, you have these receptors that are called mu opioid receptors. Mu, that's a Greek letter mu there, and I'm not very good at drawing it, so I apologize if you know the Greek alphabet and you're telling me that that looks terrible. But an easy way to remember it, and how I remember it, is that it was named mu, that's a Greek letter for M, and they named it that because it was the first receptor that these scientists discovered that could bind with morphine. So they took the N, I'm sorry, the M from morphine, and it found the Greek letter for it, mu, and decided to call it a mu opioid receptor. So these are the receptors, boom, right here, mu opioid receptors that bind with the opioids. So in this example, our orange triangle here would be an opioid. I'll write that right here, opioid. And it causes these chemicals to release, and these chemicals have a reaction. And a lot of us are fairly familiar with the opioid reaction, with what these chemicals do. It can cause analgesia, like we said, killing pain can cause sedation, it can make the person you know, feel sleepy or it suppresses the CNS, the central nervous system, euphoria, it can also cause the respiratory depression, and this is usually where we run into problems, respiratory depression, uh, and it also causes pupillary constriction, so it causes the pupils to constrict. And for the rest of the lesson, because I am not good at writing, I'm going to call pupillary constriction meiosis, which is just, in case you haven't heard it, that's another medical term that means the same thing as pupillary constriction, but it's much easier for me to write. So it causes that pupillary constriction or that meiosis, and it also causes some reduced bowel motility. Bowel motility. So that means that your intestine just aren't working as much or if at all as they normally do. So these are your primary effects of opioids right here. And so these are also what you're going to see if you're trying to diagnose someone who has taken opioids. As I also mentioned, if they take too much, you're going to get more of these things. And more analgesia isn't necessary, necessarily a problem for us, but more respiratory depression, that's definitely a problem because it can suppress your respiratory drive so much that you become hypoxic or even that you stop breathing altogether. So that's where we get into the problem and that's when we want to treat it. We don't necessarily want to treat an opioid overdose if it isn't causing respiratory depression, but once it gets to the respiratory depression phase, now we're worried because now we have a life threat to our patient. The patient is in a life-threatening condition. So how are we going to diagnose it? 
how are we going to diagnose an opioid overdose? So like I said, we're going to look at those symptoms from earlier. That's going to help us develop our list of differential diagnoses, our, thing of, our, our list of what could be causing the patient's problems. So we're going to look at things like sedation, because that's something we can observe. We can't necessarily observe analgesia, but we can observe sedation. We can observe respiratory depression. We can certainly observe meiosis by looking in the patient's eyes. And we can observe the reduced bowel motility. And as I alluded to earlier, the easiest way to do this is to auscultate with your stethoscope. Put your stethoscope over the patient's abdomen and listen. Like I said, there should be bowel sounds all the time in a normal healthy person. Even if they haven't eaten recently, there's constantly bowel sounds. So one thing you can do to help diagnose opiate overdose is to auscultate. Listen for those bowel sounds or the absence thereof. So these are some things. And of course, you're also going to want to look at a history. So if the patient has a history, if you know maybe they have some sort of chronic pain condition and they have prescribed morphine or fentanyl, or if they are uh, recovering from an addiction and they're taking methadone, um, anything like that that can lead you to kind of point in the right direction. And this can be either a history from bystanders, you know, family members, friends who can tell you this. If you're responding to the patient's residence, you can look around for pill bottles or prescriptions or something. So, of course, there's also a good history. So, the problem is that there are some other drugs that can mimic these same symptoms, or at least several of them, and make it really difficult to decide if the patient is overdosing on opioids or something else. So, when you're putting together your list of differential diagnoses, differential diagnoses, there are a couple things you can do to help rule out. So the first differential diagnosis we're going to have is opioids. You know, that's one thing. It doesn't have to be the first, but this is the first one I'm going to write down. One thing you're going to think of when you see a patient who has decreased respir respiratory drive or sedation or meiosis is that they might have overdosed on opioids. However, you might also be thinking benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines. I'm going to write the benzos here to save space. These are things like Versed or Valium or a number of others, and they especially cause that sedation. Another one is alcohol. So how are you going to differentiate between these three? And let me erase some of these symptoms over here so I have some room to write. So how are you going to diagnose or differentiate between these three main differential diagnoses? So one thing you look at is the meiosis, that pupillary constriction. Alcohol very rarely causes meiosis, that pupillary constriction. So if they do have meiosis, if their pupils are constricted, especially when you're shining a pen light or a light into them, then you can generally cross alcohol off your list. That's, it's very rare that it causes meiosis. The next one you can look at is the respiratory depressant effect. Respiratory depression. So the benzos can cause some respiratory depression. So you know, we'll put a plus sign here because they can cause positive um, respiratory depression. But the opioids cause much more. So I'm putting three signs here. So that's another way you can look at it is look at your patient. And if they're sedated but they're still breathing relatively normally, maybe a little slow, maybe you're going to think more in the direction of benzodiazepines as opposed to you look at a patient who's sedated and they're extremely bradyptic, they're not breathing at a normal rate at all, they're very low, or they're apneic entirely, that might point you in the direction of opioids. And finally, a third one is, again, another one we mentioned already, is that reduced bowel motility. And this is fairly unique to the opioids, at least out of this group. So if you auscultate your patient's bowel sounds and you don't hear much at all, that should lead you in the direction of opioids and help you to rule out benzos. So, of course, these are just three of, of many different techniques, and you can research a lot of different ways to do it, but these are three ways that I like because I think they're relatively simple, relatively easy. Look at meiosis, look at respiratory depression, and look at reduced bowel motility. One thing you do not want to do, you do not want to give naloxone to see if it causes an effect. This is sort of a an unfortunately common event in medicine where um, pre-hospital providers or even physicians in a hospital or 
other people who are giving medicine might look at a patient who, you know, they have opioids on their differential diagnosis list, but they have a couple other things too, and they're trying to narrow it down. They say, well, just give the patient some Narcan. And if they come around, if they start to do better, then we know it was an opioid. And if they don't, then we can say it wasn't an opioid. The problem with this, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the next lesson, is that this is very dangerous. You're giving a drug to a patient if you don't even know if that's the right drug for them. And that's not something we should be okay with. We shouldn't be giving patients drugs unless we're fairly certain that it's the right drug for them. And it can cause life-threatening side effects if we give it incorrectly. So you should not be doing that as part of your diagnosis process. So that sums up part one of the video. What are opioids? We've gone over some myths. We've kind of explained how the opioids worked, and we've talked about their symptoms or their side effects and how to diagnose them. In the next part, we're going to get into digging into how to actually treat it and how to help patients who have had a, an opioid overdose. So make sure you continue on and watch part two of our video series and uh, we'll finish up in the next video. Thanks for watching.